Well, we got the active box, and it'll show red on here. Okay. So if it's lit up, you're good. Okay. When your microphone lights up, you're good. So everything I said, I have to repeat? You should have a light <laughs> here. Only eight microphones can go on at one time, so if you better than the board meeting when it was only three. <laughs> All right, so take two. Uh, welcome, everybody, to the May 17, 2018 Transportation Advisory Committee meeting. We'll call the meeting to order. Uh, we have a quorum. And let's start with introductions. Victoria? Victoria Chavez, El Paso County. Jennifer Irvin, El Paso County. Shelly Cobos, City of Manitou Springs. Uh, Eric Jenkins, IMIC. Aaron Busto, Federal Highway Administration. Ken Brather, PPACG. John Leo Santos, PPACG. Rick Orphan, Fort Carson. Darren Horsmeyer, Shriver Air Force Base. Uh, Jason Dosh, Town of Palmer Lake. And Brian Vitulli, City of Colorado Springs, Mountain Metro Transit. And in the audience, please. David Young, PPACG. Darius Park Falls, Colorado Department of Transportation. Heidi Hanshin, Sita, Roadwood, PCPG. Brian Champion, Mountain Metro Transit. And staff. Jessica, <laughs> Jessica Bechtel, PPACG. Kevin Reyes, PPACG. Jennifer Valentine, PPACG. All right, great. And I uh, just wanted to say um, welcome to John. Um, thanks for being here, and we look forward to working with you. And uh, maybe if you'd like to take a few moments to introduce yourself and say a few things about yourself, we'd appreciate that. Sure, thank you. I'm, I'm uh, happy to be here in lovely uh, Colorado Springs. It's uh, nice, cool weather. I come from uh, Tucson, Arizona, where uh, I, I pretty much grew up and used to the 110, 117 uh, uh, degree summers. So I'm, I'm looking to sort of win summer with uh, folks back home. Uh, and then maybe the winters, uh, I might get some grief when it starts to snow. But other than that, uh, I come to you from the Pima Association of Governments. It's the Metropolitan Planning Organization and COG for uh, Pima County. Uh, so I do have uh, experience in, in a lot of these uh, issues coming in here. But there's a lot of things I've got to uh, still have to learn. Uh, so I look forward to being here and working collaboratively with everybody and uh, uh, forwarding the work program. So thank you very much. Oh, great. Welcome. All right, item two, uh, approval of the agenda. Could, uh, could I have a motion to approve the agenda, please? Move to approve. And a second? Second. So that's Jennifer and Victoria. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. All right, thank you. Uh, item three, public comments for any items that are not on the agenda. No comments from the audience. Um, item four, approval of last month's TAC minutes. Uh, does anybody have any uh, changes or 
suggestions? Okay, could I have a motion to approve? A motion to approve. And a second? Second. All right, that's Jason and Victoria. Thank you. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, thank you. Uh, item five, board of directors report from last month's board meeting. A tip amendment number 17. Tip Amendment 17 what was approved, and the uh, UPWP for the coming year was uh, introduced and, and presented to the uh, board as a discussion item. Uh, it, going to wait until John has had a time, chance to review it and have some input on it, and it'll go back to the board, um, come through you as well um, for final approval by the board in June or July at the latest. All right. Yes, it'll be July because anything we for June we would be talking about today. So mm -hmm. it'll be July. All right. That was all the board. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Our only action item, uh, item six, uh, membership appointments for the city of Manitou Springs. Uh, transportation planner with PPACG. Uh, we do? Uh, nope, I still see no light. Thanks. There we go. Okay, perfect. Um, so the city of Manitou Springs has um, gotten some new staff members, and I took a look at some of the old uh, documents from our board of directors and realized that they have they um, assigned a new alternate member, but they never assigned a new primary uh, representative for TAC after uh, Wade Burkholder was replaced. So. Um, I'm not sure if we actually need to have this on TAC, the TAC agenda, but I wanted to write a memo to avoid any confusion or ambiguities with the City of Manitou Springs representatives. So uh, I just put who their primary is and the two alternatives that they have uh, in the memo, and they also uh, wrote us a letter, which is an attachment number one. Um, just wanted to bring this to, to TAC to make sure that we're on the same page with uh, Manitou Springs. I believe uh, Woodland Park is also going to be having some new members, and we'll get that um, for next month's uh, agenda as well. So. That's everything for this. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Welcome, Shelly. Now you get to pull double duty with the RTA and PPACG. Wonderful. So. Thank you for having me. Sure. Do we have to offer in? What's that? Do we have to yeah. In? Yeah. Um, could I have a motion to recommend approval of this item? So moved. And a second? second. All right. Thank you. There. That's Victoria and Jennifer. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Kevin. Okay, item 7A. Uh, these are all of our discussion items. National Highway Performance System. Darius, welcome. All right, thank you very much for having me down today. Um, my name is Darius Pockbaz. I am the Performance Data Manager within the Division of Transportation Development at CDOT. Um, and today I wanted to talk about the national performance measures which are um, we are required by the FAST Act to uh, set statewide targets on and some of the um, options available to MPOs over the next coming months. So I have two separate presentations, um, so I'll, I'll go this one first and then I'll jump to the next one. Um, so moving on, let's see here, I can find the mouse, there we go. So this slide here gives you a basic overview of the three areas within the National Performance Measure program that was established by the FAST Act in 2015. <coughs> Excuse me. The, so safety um, was the uh, fatalities and the fatality rate measures that were already s approved last year, and then the MPOs had the option to support the state targets or set their own um, in February. The two areas that I'll talk about um, briefly um, in this presentation are, regards, are in regards to infrastructure conditions, so pavement and bridge metrics, and then the new system performance metrics that, um, that have been, that are required to, that we are required to report. 
So as you can see, we are required to have targets, statewide targets, the DOT, by 520, which is in, which is actually this weekend. So we already have those targets set up, and I'll show those a little bit later in the slide. Um, the targets were approved by the uh, Colorado Transportation Commission last month. Uh, MPOs um, that have national highway uh, system um, routes within their boundaries can either uh, support the state targets or come up with their own targets by November 15th, which is 180 days after the state sets its targets. So November 15th is the, is the deadline for that. So this map, it's a little hard to see, but you kind of get the idea of what the two, er the two areas that, we, uh, that the measures for infrastructure condition system performance, where they apply to. They don't apply to all state highway roads. They only apply to the interstates, which are in blue, and then the uh, non-interstate NHS, which is in red. So, and that includes um, national highway system routes that are not owned by the DOT as well. So any, any routes that are designated, by, designated as national highway system routes, uh, the measures apply to them. <laughs> So the first, um, the first section is infrastructure condition, and they rate, they rate the highways and the bridges in good, fair, and poor condition. So it's a little bit of departure from what CDOT has, has used as metrics for our own um, management and decision-making process. Uh, we used drivability life for, the, uh, for pavement in the past. Um, and for bridges, we use non-structurally deficient bridge deck area. Now, I should say that because these measures are out there, that does not mean that we are, that we are not or we are going to change our measures. So that is not the case um, currently. We are going to report what's required for the federal government, but we are still using uh, drivability life as our metric to make decisions. So right here, you can see the current condition. I know it's a little small. Maybe I can zoom in a bit so we can read it. So for the, uh, for the interstate system, we have 45% in good condition and we have less than a quarter in poor condition under this new definition. And so our targets that we've set are on the left there. We have to set a two-year and a four-year target for the first performance period. So a target for 2020 and a target for 2022. The second two lines um, under that are for the non-interstate NHS, around 50% good and about 1% poor um, for those measures. And then we have the R2 target, or, or excuse me, our four targets uh, for, for those routes um, statewide. And then finally, bridge deck area classified in good condition. We have about 49% in good condition, 4% poor condition, very similar to the old structurally deficient, uh, stru non-structurally deficient metric that we have used in the past. And those, and we have our statewide two and four year targets. Yes. So what's good fair for? Is it pavement quality? Yes, it's pavement quality. Um, this next slide, if I can get, kind of hard to see the mouse here. This shows what goes into those particular, um, that, the particular good, fair, poor. So we take into account international roughness index, rutting, cracking, depending on the, uh, and faulting, depending on the pavement type. For a pavement to be considered poor, two of those three distresses must fall into the poor category. Um, for it to be considered good pavement, all three have to be considered good in order for it to be, con in order for the pavement segment to be considered good. And it, all the pavement segments are looked at, at on tenth of a mile segments, and then we combine it all to get an entire system wide number. Okay. Welcome. So um, this slide kind of helps illustrate what, what we've used before, trying to create some sort of matrix. Um, if you've seen our drivability life measure before, you can kind of see we had this, this mix of high, moderate, and low versus what the new federal definition has, which um, good can be spread out a long ways, and poor is only is the, like the worst of the worst highways um, um, according to the new definition. Um, finally, here's just some pictures to kind of illustrate with the uh, with pavement. So this we used to measure it as moderate drivability life, but it's considered good under the um, new federal definition. Oops. So this one is um, 
Uh, this one we used to consider low drivability life, but under the federal definition, it is good um, be based on how the measures are calculated um, as prescribed by the law. Um, I'll skip around to something a little bit different. So this is a fair road according to the federal guidelines, and we, um, our drivability life model agreed that was a moderate road. And then this final slide here, this is a poor road. This is um, I-70 in the mountains, and um, it is, we agree that's a, a low drivability life road. Okay. Um, any questions on pavement and bridge before I move on to the to the system performance measures? Okay. And just click on the uh, the. Uh, oh, there we go. Is it the uh, the uh, agenda? Yes. Okay. Uh, there we go. We're getting to it. Okay. Apologize for that. So the third, the second section I'll talk about today, the system performance measures. There are um, around ten new measures that have to be reported on. On, on the two and four year basis for the federal government on a statewide level. So those are level of travel time reliability for the interstate, level of travel time reliability for the non-interstate NHS, and the truck travel time reliability for the interstate system, the um, emission reduction benefit from CMAC projects, which are the bottom four lines. And then there are two um, traffic congestion metrics for uh, peak hours of excessive delay and, and single occupant, non single occupancy vehicle, those two measures, according to the federal law for this performance period between now and 2022, only apply to to MPOs that have a urbanized area of one million a population or above. So it only applies now to Denver, um, and so those targets are only for the Denver metro area right now. The other two, the system performance and the uh, CMAC measures, do apply um, throughout the state. So these are all of our um, approvals that we have for the targets already. Um, here, let me see if I can make this a tiny bit smaller. There we go. So. Again, this is the, this is just the description of the measures as per the um, as per uh, the federal regulations, um, and this is how to calculate the level of travel time reliability. The first measure. So, basically, we look at um, each segment of highway, which is about tenth of a mile. We uh, the formula above assigns an index to it um, for each time period bin, and if the time period is, or if the, in, excuse me, if the index for, for one of the time periods is above 1.5, then it is considered not reliable. So this, uh, it's important to note that this is not necessarily a congestion metric, metric it, it's a reliability metric. So a, a segment can be congested and still be reliable um, using this formula. So is that calculated on a per lane basis, or is that calculated um, on an overall system basis? It's calculated on a segment basis, all lanes in the segment, so tenth of a mile segments in the system. So, for example, if we were to look at managed lanes, um, say, for example, on the gap section, um, would CDOT be looking at that on an overall basis? Because you're going to have different travel time reliability in that managed lane versus the, the unmanaged lanes. That that is a question. I don't know the exact answer for it, but the um, the the segment as a total is what is what's going to be used for calculate. So my assumption is it's going to be what what are what are the average between the two lanes, but I don't know the specifics in the database in order to give a an exact answer to that question. Uh, the second piece of it, once you calculate the reliability, is the um, is to calculate the number of persons that travel through that particular segment, and then you get the total. Then you're able to get the total for the segment, and then the total for the entire system. So um, I know it's a little bit of a complicated measure, but I'll get to what we are doing as far as a database for that in in just a bit. 
So um, moving on to truck travel time, same same methodology, same way of, 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 of calculating it, but we're only looking for the index. They're not looking for the percent of trucks that travel through the, uh, through the segment. So again, it's reliable if it's at 1.5 or below. Okay. Um, here, I'm going to skip around a little bit. So to give you a little bit of an idea, we've already pulled some of the data using the data source that is um, recommended by uh, the federal government, which is the uh, NPM RDS, the National Performance Measure Database Research Set. Um, we take the data from that, they do all the calculations for us, and we submit it to the federal government through our HPMS system every single year. For PPACG, for all the interstate, for the, excuse me, the interstates, you see on the top we're around between 80 and 90 percent depending on the year, and then the non-interstate travel time reliability is at the bottom. I think 2012 might be an outlier. Um, the data might not be as reliable going back there, but um, in the, uh, the mid-60s for most of the past four years. What accounts for the drop in 2013 for the interstate? Um, I don't know. We can take a look at the, um, the specific data because we can break it out by month, but, with that, um, but without having to dig like, deep into specific segments of the data, um, we're, 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 we don't know for offhand. But that is something that can be done. Mm -hmm. And then this is the truck travel time reliability for um, uh, within the PPACG boundaries. Only a it only applies to the interstate here. So um, for the mo past three years, it's been below the 1.5 threshold, um, and then uh, compared to uh, four and five years back. Any questions on truck travel time or level of travel time reliability? I got it. Yeah. General question, Darius. Yes. In terms of this and, and the previous performance measurements, on you were talking about tenth of a mile segments. Yes. Uh, how have you or, or how has CDOT defined those tenth of a mile segments? Is it a standard thing that we would have access to, or do we get to define where a tenth of a mile starts and where it ends? That's a good question. Um, the tenth of a mile segment is established by the uh, the NPM RDS, so they have their own segments established for that. Um, we are uh, currently part of a pooled fund with other states to have access to the advanced tools of this data set. Right now, um, you can go in and, and download the raw data from it and do the calculations yourself. But we are, but we have asked for the additional uh, tools in order for the calculations to be done for us to kind of, you know, make lives easier on us, with especially with brand new complicated metrics as of these. Uh, we will be uh, uh, having um, discussions on how we can grant access to that to our MPO partners, um, which is allowed under the, um, under the contract, so that way they can take a look at this data themselves and and dive into the uh, to the tools and, and pull these types of graphs as well. Thank you. Okay. Um, the final measure that I have to talk about today is the um, CMAC pollute uh, CMAC on road mobile emissions. Now this is a reduction benefit. So the higher the number is is better. Um, and it only applies to the benefits that you see from the CMAC funded pro, uh, project. So any of the projects funded with CMAC dollars, uh, the, uh, the measure is looking at the two and four year totals of the various uh, pollutants or precursors, the benefit reductions that the project gives for that. So this particular example here um, has five projects and they add up um, nitrous oxides, volatile organic compounds, and carbon monoxide together and that's, that's what we would re report on a statewide level. So um, um, additionally, the MPOs with this measure are, have the opportunity to support the state target or uh, come up with their own targets. 
uh, we the data for this particular measure is available from the CMAC um, public um, access database which is available from the FHWA website we're able to report projects going back to 2008 and see what were the benefit reduction numbers for each project um, the one of the final slides that I have here I can skip around just a bit Ah, here we go. So these are the total of uh, the totals for each of the um, pollutants or precursors that um, that projects funded by CMAX reported for the the latest two years that we have data. So 2015 and 2016 um, by the MPOs that had um, that had reports in there. So um, PPACG is on the far right. It's about 125 um, kilograms per day reduction in carbon monoxide. Um, for for that two year period of that was the toll from all the projects and then for the four year totals we had um, about 319 carbon monoxide kilograms per day and some of the other pollutants of uh, volatile organic compounds uh, nitrous oxides and particulate matter so and then that was the report um, so we would set uh, two and four year targets on these and uh, currently look and Basically, we're currently looking at what we can do to um, make sure that we have um, access to this data to kind of uh, make sure that we can um, project the future. Our, our methodology for setting these targets right now is to look at what was done in the past and take a conservative approach um, on the statewide level. Yeah, Darius? Yes. A, a question coming to you, Aaron. Uh, we have CMAC projects in, in 2018, and if I remember right, we have one in 2019, the last yeah, one. Yes. Uh, so that's we have no project CMAC projects beyond that. So in this goal setting, we would still be required to set a goal for the existing 2018, 2019 projects, but then our four-year goal would be zero or not applicable. Well, you're for, well, if you just, of course, the MPO has the opportunity to support the state targets, but if you want to set your own targets, um, you would report, if you have 19 and 20, or excuse me, 18 and 19, you would report those for the two-year target. For the four-year target, it would be a combination of all those four years, so 18, 19, 20, and 21. Okay. So that's what you would look at as the target. All right, so there would still be, all right. Yeah. Thank you. So um, just to um, wrap up uh, the presentation, sorry for jumping around a bit with it, um, but um, we have the, uh, the statewide target set the, uh, the, in your packet. You can see what the statewide targets for all the measures for infrastructure condition and system performance um, have been set and, and passed and approved by the commission. We will uh, submit those this weekend to FHWA um, to meet the May 20th required deadline per the um, FAST Act law rulemaking. Excuse me. And we'll be working with the MPOs in order to either uh, um, support the statewide target or to um, set your own targets for the applicable measures um, by November 15th, um, 180 days from now. So um, we'll be looking to see what data is available, what we can do to help with um, access to some of the uh, MPM RDS data sets and um, um, any other support that might be needed. Thank you. Any other questions? So on setting the targets for the MPO area, it's still just for the interstate and the national highway system, not for other local roads. Correct. Um, for uh, it's especially important for uh, pavement and bridge. We don't want to look at local roads or state highway system roads or county roads for those. It's only the NHS, including the off system NHS and interstates. Um, same for the system reliability metrics, the level of travel time reliability and the uh, truck travel time reliability. For the CMAC measures, that's it's a little bit different because it's project based, so it's the, what the projects had on there and the reports on there, so it's, it's not it's not a one to one relationship on there. So it is different from what we did with safety, which is all roads. So this is this is just interstate and non interstate NHS. Yes, Thank you. you're welcome. Any other questions or comments for well, Darius? I'll just finish up and, and, and say that we did adopt last year CDOT's state or uh, statewide safety target. We did not develop our own target, and uh, 
that was done through board approval, you know, through the committees um, and, and a resolution. Uh, moving forward now, we have to same same decision for the rest of these performance measures. Do we develop our own or do we support the states? Uh, and, and at the end, they'll be board approved and, and a memorandum of understanding developed between PPACG and CDOT uh, that will be, will be developed and you know we're all learning how to do this since it's never been done before and, uh, whether we're going to wind up with a resolution or a, a memorandum for every performance measure or when it's all said and done they'll all get wrapped up into one but right now we have a memorandum with CDOT uh, for the safety target uh, and this we and the rest of the MPOs work through this and what does it mean to support the state target or if we develop our own what does that mean to CDOT if, if we decide that we want to be more stringent higher level or something on, on an NH for a S road that happens to belong to CDOT the, those what, yeah I'm sorry. what does that mean well <clears throat> according to the law only the um, interstate and the bridge have specific penalties for um, not meeting the targets. And they're not the targets that we have up there, but they're minimum levels of, of minimum condition levels that are set in law. So 5% of the interstate cannot be more than, 5% of the interstate cannot be poor. So we have to keep that below. As you saw, the statewide um, number is at 0.25, so we're well below that. Additionally, 10% of the bridge deck area across the state cannot be um, considered poor. We're at 4%. So we're way below the targets where any type of penalties would come by, and basically it, the, the penalties would be losing control um, over a portion of the dollars that would that go to these particular programs. Did I get that right? So um, if we uh, don't meet targets, um, we also have the opportunity to... Um, adjust our targets in two years so we can adjust the four-year target in 2020 um, but there, within the law there is no specific penalties for the MPOs but just keep in mind that FHWA will want to see uh, these measures being incorporated into plans in the future um, that, that, that will be something that um, FHWA as they come up with their rulemaking um, and uh, plans will come up with in the future but Within the law, there's no specific penalties listed for MPOs not meeting targets. Shelley. So I was wondering on the air quality measures, yes. where, where are your gauges? Where are you taking measurements? Uh, these aren't, uh, these aren't, we aren't taking measures, the um, measurements. These are anticipated benefit reductions from CMAC projects. So they have a project and they calculate out the uh, the number of kilograms per day benefit reduction for each of these measures if when this project is implemented. So it's not um, air quality reporting that um, MPOs and uh, TPRs have to do on a regular basis. This is only based on those CMAC projects. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right, anything else? All right, thank you, Darius. Thank you, Chair. Okay, item 7B, an update on the small area forecast. Jennifer. Okay, Jennifer Valentine, I'm a transportation planner with PPACG. Um, so last month I, I gave a pretty detailed presentation on the methodology and assumptions behind the small area forecast. So my intention this month is really to focus uh, my remarks and my presentation on the changes we've made since last month. Um, certainly if as I'm going through you have a question about you know, the methodology and assumptions, um, it is included again as an attachment in your packet, but please feel free to chime in and ask any questions you have. Okay, so since last month, um, and I'm just going to run through this list. So the first thing, we had a request to share our base year data so you could more easily compare what's happening between 2015 and 2045. So um, a few days after the TAC meeting, I sent out 
that information as a KMZ and also to shape files to um, El Paso County who requested those. I also had a request to share all of our notes from the different meetings we've had with um, member entities, our military representatives, and all the comments we received from our small team of economic experts. So I sent those out on the same day. Um, we also had a comment about the residential density classifications in our last series of maps. We did decide to retain the classifications we had just because it preserved a little bit more detail for us. Um, we felt like there really is um, a difference we'd like to see between five dwelling units per acre and one or two. Um, we also had a comment from um, Brandy, I think, about fountain development projects. And so they provided um, a disc with 15 additional projects to enter, so we went ahead and did that. Um, there were some comments about the numbers for the military installations. So if you recall, we treat the military installations a little bit differently from the rest of the land area in the region. Um, we use what we call adjustments because you know, growth in the military installations isn't subject to the market the same way that regular um, jobs and dwelling units would be. Um, so we did have either in-person or email or phone conversations with um, all of our different representatives and got those numbers updated. We got some really good information, so um, thank you for that. Um, and then probably the most substantial comment we received was um, about the infill mask. Um, and so if you recall, we started out with our infill mask as um, incorporated areas. So we received the comment that maybe that wasn't appropriate based on, especially based on how infill was defined through um, the public process and the workshop that we held um, to develop our land use scenarios. So our first remedy for this was we did sort of a visual inspection. We brought up aerial photography along with the infill mask and we realized actually there were a few areas that were being covered by the mask um, that were clearly already developed I and mean, you could see lots of rooftops there. Um, so we went through and did that and made the same changes to the new center's mask. Um, so just a quick reminder because I'm going to be talking about these. So um, through the scenario planning workshop and public process we held, these were kind of the definitions of our three land use scenarios. So we looked at infill as being New development is concentrated in already developed areas. New centers is basically infill plus um, what we'd expect to see pop up, some new nodes or new activity centers. And then dispersed development is kind of a trends continue scenario. So in addition to what we heard from the TAC meeting, we also had the CAC meeting. We had a series of additional meetings with some of our member entities, and we just realized a few things ourselves that needed to be changed. Um, so last time the, the series of maps we presented was just based on density, so residential units per acre and jobs per acre. And we realized that um, people might need another way to kind of visualize um, how things are changing over the years. So that's how we ended up with the <laughs> 198 maps that were um, linked to in your packet. We just wanted to be really transparent about what was happening in each TAS. Is there a gain? <coughs> Is there a loss? What's the number change? What's the percentage change? And I'm going to bring up um, a KMZ of this in a minute because we have made a few changes since the packet went out. It's an ongoing process. And you can really quickly kind of at a glance see where the gains and the losses are. Um, we've also continued to refine the mask structure that we're using. Um, we did notice that we weren't getting as much differentiation between the three land use scenarios as we, as we would like. In particular, the 50% mask um, just didn't seem to be quite strong enough, so we've been experimenting with an 80% mask. Um, so we also, um, we have a few different figures that we're comparing the model output to. You know, we've had conversations with City of Colorado Springs about what they expect to see in the downtown core, what types of development in the coming years. Um, and so our numbers were a little bit low compared to what they're expecting. So we went ahead and increased the um, maximum dwelling units per acre figure just for the kind of core downtown Colorado Springs zone. Um, so then we also received a series of written comments from um, El Paso County staff, and that's what the next few things will uh, refer to here. We did provide um, a written response back, um, but there are a few things I want to touch on. 
So um, one very astute observation was that we were actually seeing um, loss of residential units and loss of jobs um, near, near Falcon, which obviously is a pretty fast-growing area. So we needed to dig into that a little bit and see what was going on. Um, so the first thing we did was we found about eight different development projects that um, we could add to the model to kind of help set that first five-year trajectory of growth. So the other issue, um, the other issue we had was um, the information that was sent out was comparing 2015 and 2045. So um, I asked the you know the GIS specialist who's been helping me with this project to, okay, so I gave him the 2045 model output and I said compare this to 2015. So well, what 2015? You know, where does your 2015 data come from? So. Um, we had American Community Survey data from 2015, which is at the block group level, that then has to be somehow distributed into our TASs or transportation analysis zones. So that's what was used in the materials that were sent out to all of you. Um, we since realized that another way you could compare it is to look at the 2015 output from Urban Sim, which I know sounds a little weird since it's in the past, but so Urban Sim uses 2010 census data because it's much more accurate than the American Community Survey, which is just a sample. So we found that when we compared 2015 urban sim output to 2045 urban sim output, we didn't see those losses anymore. So there was a little bit of a discrepancy in the, the base year data, but fortunately the only place that that ACS data was introduced was in kind of our own comparison. It has nothing to do with what's actually in the model. So we're not really seeing a loss of residential units in the Falcon area or other places where you wouldn't expect it. Okay, so then the last thing we did, um, another really insightful comment we received from the county was, what about that 2015 population and employment boundary that was approved as part of your targets and objectives and scoring criteria? And at first I thought, why didn't we use that? And then I realized it was kind of a timing issue. So, so we did our scenario planning workshop um, last June. And if you recall, we pretty recently just got through the targets and objectives and the scoring criteria. So when we were trying to develop the infill mask, that 2015 population and employment boundary didn't even exist. Um, but so at this point, there's actually, there actually isn't any reason that we couldn't use that, that boundary. And so um, just as a refresher, that was defined as a thousand people and or jobs per square mile. And then we went through the exercise of um, adding in several roads connecting out to Shriver and up to Falcon. Um, and I'll show you. Oh, this isn't it. So, th so this is the inverse of that boundary. So if I can get the mouse to work. Um, you can just barely make out here roads and then this is the boundary. So basically the, the hole here is, is what was approved as that infill boundary. So just to kind of show you the difference, um, so here was, let's see, so here was our initial infill boundary. That's that's what you saw last month um, as part of those materials. So the first thing we did was to open up some space down in security and wide field that was that was previously under the mask and shouldn't have been because it was clearly already developed. The other area um, was in the Falcon area. So we opened up a number of TASs here that were already developed. So the, the main difference you can see here um, is kind of in this area, there's more closure. Otherwise, it's, it's surprisingly similar uh, based on the fact that this stemmed from incorporated areas and then a visual inspection of aerial photography. And this is 1,000 people and or jobs per square mile. Um, so we did. One more model run um, yesterday, I think, and we have some KMZs that, that we'll show here in, in Google Earth. And so the results look just a little bit different. You know, I told Jennifer before the meeting, fortunately we're not asking for a recommendation today because, you know, every day the, the model and the output is, is still changing, but we're getting, we're getting closer. Okay, so the last thing I wanted to do is just, um, I didn't do this last time and I thought it might help just to have one slide for each scenario tell you kind of like an overview and what are the assumptions behind it. So, so once again, that the infill mask is used to 
help the model prioritize development in those already developed areas, so in that NASC hole. Um, I already went over the 2015 boundary. And then, so aside from the mask, the main thing that we use is the underlying zoning classifications. So in the infill scenario, we essentially upzone um, certain classifications to prioritize development there. So under infill, it's high density residential, downtown or commercial business district zones, mixed use, and then we had a couple of special categories for core downtown Colorado Springs and Manitou um, gateway mixed use district. Okay, so new centers, um, as I said in a previous slide, is basically infill plus um, the opportunity for additional activity centers. Um, so we prioritize the areas a little bit different. Um, you know, we started with the incorporated areas, added in census designated places, and then things that were zoned uh, PUD because that's where we expect to see quite a bit of future growth and development. Um, so in terms of zoning, we prioritized high-density residential, mixed-use, and PUD. We didn't include the downtown commercial business district because that's really the hallmark of infill, not so much of new centers. Okay, and then, so this is the new centers mask. Hopefully you still have the, the infill mask in your mind, but you can see that there are a lot of opportunities, additional opportunities um, for the mask to, to create activity centers. Um, I'll get to it in a minute, but it, it's very difficult to get the model to sort of spontaneously create a new sort of small city or town or activity center on the periphery. Oh, uh, where are you talking about? Here? I mean, this, this is the Falcon area, yeah. So, so I don't think the airport is um, is considered a mass coal. Uh, okay. Does that answer your question? Okay. All right. So then, finally, the dispersed scenario doesn't have any mask. The underlying zoning um, dictates the development capacity. So it's if it's 10 dwelling units per acre, it's 10 dwelling units per acre. Um, and, and there's no assumption of prioritizing any types of zones over others. So um, if, if high density residential is 15 dwelling units per acre today, we wouldn't assume that that changed in the future. Okay, so here's sort of the fun part. So we've been doing a few what we call sanity checks. We do have a few areas that um, we have some sense of what the numbers might be in the future. So. A really good example is Woodland Park because they're one of the few um, of our member entities who, who do have kind of a projected build out uh, based on land and water availability and that's 12,600. So we were pretty happy to see that um, our model results were kind of between 12,600 and 12,700 population. So that was a good first check. Um, so just to be clear, the the other three are in residential units. Uh, different entities just sort of gave us different numbers or think about, thought about things in a different way. Um, so for Banning Lewis, we have had quite a few conversations with um, Carl and his staff. Um, so what we're seeing, there's, there's a bit of a range between the scenarios, which is what we wanted to see. But they're capturing between 24 and 29 percent of the region's new residential units. Pretty big land area, lots of development slated for that area seems pretty reasonable. Um, so I also thought it was interesting to point out how much of a difference is there between the dispersed and the infill scenarios, which are kind of our two bookends, and it was about 16 percent. So about 35,000 residential units um, in one scenario and 42,000 in the other was, was the range. So the next area we've been looking at is the Downtown Development Authority area, so kind of the core of um, downtown Colorado Springs. So this is about 2% of the region's new residential units, and there was an 11% difference between the dispersed and the infill scenario. Um, you know, at first when we were looking at these numbers, we thought, gosh, there's not that much of a difference between the like 2,500 and the 2,800, but 
you know, it's it's sort of the same magnitude, a similar magnitude as with Banning Lewis. It's just obviously a smaller set of numbers. So this is what we ended up with with our most recent model runs. And then um, just one more we checked because Fountain is also a pretty pretty fast growing area. They're looking at between 21 and 26 percent of the region's new residential units. Okay, I think this might actually be the last slide. Um, so a, a few of the remaining challenges I just wanted to touch on. Um, so, so we had these three conceptual land use scenarios from the public process, from our workshop, from the outreach. Um, and our task was to make these a reality within urban sim, within the model. Um, and so what we realized is that we've set this trajectory based on what's on the ground right now and then the development projects we entered for the next five to ten years. So we're, we're kind of talking about like a big cruise ship or a tanker. It's not, it's not a motorboat. It's not a speedboat. You can't just decide, I want to veer over to this island right away. Um, so we already have that trajectory set. We're, we're kind of headed towards the dispersed development scenario. And so the other two scenarios are kind of just a slight deviation from that. So we, we really didn't end up with extreme differences between the scenarios, but it kind of, it kind of makes sense. So as I mentioned before, you know, we did have a little bit of trouble encouraging the model to develop new activity centers. Um, one other thing we did just after the last TAC meeting was we made sure that um, we weren't inhibiting growth in areas that were um, kind of pipeline development projects. So we did open up a few additional holes in the new center's mask, especially in some of the El Paso County development projects. Um, I think I talked about this a little bit last time, but one thing that's really, really on our wish list for next time is having what's called a pro forma model. And so that's basically a way to say, you know, maybe all of downtown Colorado Springs or maybe all of Manitou Springs or Woodland Park or whatever is part of the mask whole. But are there areas within each of those jurisdictions that are, are more likely to develop than others. So having kind of a tiered system where, you know, North Nevada or South Nevada or Academy or, or places that we know things are happening could have an even higher um, structure than other parts of the, the current whole. We weren't able to do that this time, but um, we'd like to think of a way to do it in the future. So um, our base year is 2015, and obviously a lot of development has happened between 2015 and today. So we've been trying to fill in that gap with these, you know, 200 plus development projects that we had to enter in, not just what's in the pipeline, but what's happened in the past three years. And we don't have it. We don't have everything. You know, we don't have every single development project that's happened in the, th the last three years. Um, so hopefully next time we'll have 2020 base year data, and um, we'll be doing the small area forecast shortly thereafter. Um, and then finally, the employment data sets are always kind of a challenge. You don't really have a, a census of employment data, so you just have to use the best available data. I would just like to know um, which PPACG staff member got to go on a cruise to take that photo. <laughs> because, you know, there's photos of Pikes Peak and Cog Rail Road and all of that. But Right. Yeah. That, that photo was from the Internet. Oh, was it? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> all right, so... Okay, so now um, I would like to switch over to Google Earth and just um, sort of toggle back and forth between the scenarios and show you a little bit about what's our most recent um, data set. Like I said, we, we have kind of switched over to showing number change and percent change in addition to density because it seems like that's a little bit more intuitive for people to think about and then so I don't have to come back to it. This is the same schedule timeline that's um, in your memo. so. We're here around step seven, and um, hopefully we'll be looking for a recommendation on this item from you all next month and taking it to the board in July. But let's get to the, let's get to the maps. Okay. Um, okay, so just really quickly, it's a little bit easier to see here. So the pink is the... Um, the infill boundary that was used to produce the information in your packet, and the blue is the 2015 population and employment boundary that was used to produce the information I'm going to show you today. So you can really clearly see where the differences are. It's mostly 
along here, um, and then of course, you know, Schriever as a um, job center and the connecting roads are a major difference. But if I can, if I can see the screen, I will toggle back and forth. Um, so what I think is really interesting to do is to show. Okay, so this is the dispersed residential units, um, and let me turn on the legend. Okay, so blue means that there was a loss in residential units between 2015 and 2045. Green means there was a gain, and gray means there was no change. And we took the liberty of saying plus or minus five units because we did end up with some big bright squares um, that were like a loss of one unit or something. Um, so you can kind of see in the dispersed scenario, um, you pretty much see growth everywhere. I mean, as you zoom in, you do see a TAS here or there where, where there are losses. And um, the nice thing about the KMZ is you can click on it and, well, I can't see that, but you can see what the actual, actual numbers were. Um, so if you kind of toggle back and forth between um, dispersed residential units and infill residential units, those were our two kind of bookend scenarios. Um, you can start to see some changes. Um, it's, the infill is a little bit more concentrated. Everything still looks pretty stable. You don't see a lot of losses. You see a lot of grays. Um, but when you, when you start looking at jobs, um, for a number of reasons, the, the masks and the, the model, it's much more sensitive to changes with jobs than it is with residential units. I think part of that is because we have so many development projects that are, that are telling the model the trajectory of growth for residential units, whereas I think jobs are um, maybe a little bit more fluid. Um, let's see. So that one, you can see a, you know, a pretty big difference. Let me zoom out just a little bit. So if, if the green is the gains, you know, you can really see those gains concentrated in a much tighter area in the infill scenario than in dispersed. Um, and it gets a little bit confusing when you throw in new centers because it's such a hybrid. Um, but it's, uh, you can still see kind of a similar change. So this is, this is kind of our preferred tool of, I mean, obviously we're looking at the entire region. If you're interested in, you know, if you're interested in um, Calhan, you know, you can zoom in and kind of look at Calhan or um, wherever you want. So it's, it's designed to be, and you know, some of these, it looks like it's this big blue, big blue blob. It's a loss, but really it's, you know, probably five or ten jobs or five or ten residential units. So that's where it comes in handy to have the attributes pop up like this. So in terms of presentation, I think um, that's all I have. Can I answer any questions? Questions or comments? For Jennifer? Great job. Oh. When do we expect to see the final one um, so that we're have time to review hundreds and hundreds of tazes between, I mean, I hope it's not just the week before because you're going to kill us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, so the next major step we have is, um, is travel model integration. That's the very last thing we do. Um, it's kind of a handshake back and forth between Urban Sim and our, our travel model. And um, so our intention is to start that, you know, tomorrow or Monday. I mean, we w obviously wanted to make sure to see if there were any major comments from you all. Um, we're going to gamble a little bit and go ahead and start that. Um, our CAC meeting isn't until the 30th. Um, we can't wait until then um, to start it or we won't make it. Um, on the off chance that something happens there that changes our direction, we'll have to figure out what to do. Um, all that being said, we're, we're going to do it as fast as we can. We definitely want to give you plenty of time to review, so um, I'll just say we'll do everything we can to give you more than the week. I definitely understand it's a, it's a lot to review, so. And thank you for listening to my comments. I appreciate it. Sure. No, they, they were great comments, and um, I've appreciated all the input we've received. I think it's, um, we've made a lot of good improvements in the last month or two. I mean, the chances of anybody from the CAC bringing up issues are 
pretty slim, right? Yeah, I mean, they, they had more questions and comments mm -hmm. last month, but um, just the fact that this is the second time everybody's seen the methodology, um, I think we're probably in pretty good shape. Yeah. So. Yeah. All right, great. Thanks, Jennifer. Okay. Okay, item 7C, flexible tip funding policy. Kevin. Good afternoon, Kevin Reyes, Transportation Planner with PPACG. So we're at that time of the quarter where we are now starting to address uh, any cost overruns that uh, project sponsors might have with uh, any projects that they have in the uh, 2017 to 2022 tip. Um, now that we have finished the call for projects for the upcoming tip, the 2019 to 2022 tip, we now know how much money is left unprogrammed in the current tip. So uh, if you look at your memo, you can see that. Um, so in CMAC, we have just over $34,000 unprogrammed. And in TAP, we have just over $106,000 unprogrammed. Um, and then it's STP Metro doesn't have any, uh, any funds left uh, in fiscal year 2018. So uh, any project sponsors that... Um, would like to seek any additional funds for a project. Um, we have the questionnaire that's attached to uh, your memo, which is also on our website. Uh, you can get that on the uh, on the tip page of our website. We ask you to fill that out, and uh, you can email that to me um, or anyone in the transportation department. They'll forward it to me, and um, that we ask you to fill that out by the end of end of this month. And um, you if. If you don't want any additional funds, you also have the option of changing the scope of work for your project, and you would fill out the same exact form and, and kind of explain exactly uh, what uh, what that would entail. And then next month, uh, we'll bring this uh, through the committees again uh, and have some discussion if necessary, and then we'll get it approved by the board uh, the following month. And if you miss uh, this quarter to address any cost overruns, the next time you can fill out this questionnaire is going to be the last day of August. Um, so that, that's going to be a few months away from now. So uh, any questions on that? Perfect. Exactly, yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, the last bullet point here uh, mentions project sponsors can cancel one of their own projects. So you, you know, we, you might be able to try to get around it. We can have discussion, and um, you know, we'll take it through the committees and decide if it's something that does not change the inherent. The, the biggest thing is not changing the inherent functionality of the project. So. Mm -hmm. I think you, you could do that as long as you can prove that you're not changing the inherent functionality of the project. Yeah, I believe we thought of everything <laughs> with that <laughs> policy task force. Yeah. We met enough to consider <laughs> everything. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Right, item 7D, CDOT Transit Development Program. Ken. I want to take advantage of the fact that I'm already sitting down at a microphone rather than standing up over there. Uh, it's Ken Brather, PPACG Transportation Planner. Last month, I introduced this topic. Michael Snow was here to, to present the, uh, th this topic and introduce it. CDOT is developing a uh, transit plan statewide so that if money comes available, what projects would, would they spend the money on? They are as looking for two things, and it's been a little confusing. Things have been changing um, since he introduced it. Uh, they are interested in a complete inventory of both capital and operational transit projects in the PPACG region. Right now, they are also focusing on priorities and a prioritization recommendation by PPACG of capital projects only. 
they will come forward in a second phase for prioritization of operational projects. This is in preparation for any money that the legislator, legislature was hoped to provide this past season and or the ballot issue that the Denver Chamber of Commerce is proposing for this fall. Um, since our last meeting, they have reduced the estimate of funding available. Um, I think it was two billion dollars or something like that. They're, they've dropped it down to one and a half billion with PPACG's planning share, not a promise, not a commitment of 9% of that amount, so it would be 135.3 million for transit funding in the PPACG area. Um, the other clarification is they are seeking capital projects for, for the priority list. They are seeking capital projects only. But after discussion at the last stack meeting, um, they would also like to have the 10-year operational cost of those capital projects. So if you're going to buy a bus for 750000 that's capital. But then what does it cost to operate that bus for 10 years? They also want that cost. If you're going to build a new bus station, there is a capital cost to construct it, and then there's an operational cost over the next 10 years to run it and maintain it. So they are looking for those additional dollars. I did not receive any additional, uh, last month Michael handed out a, a, a list of projects that, that are included in today's packet as well. The only other <coughs> um, the projects that have been in, submitted to us or, or identified were the unfunded transit project list, table 8-2, in our current 2040 plan. Um, in Michael's list that he handed out, there's a total cost of 53,800,000. Uh, in our unfunded transit project list in the 2040 plan, the total cost is 673,164,000. So add those together, and I, I, I noticed just before the meeting that there's a little bit of overlap, so somewhere around $700 million we've identified as projects in our region that, that we want to do. Um, and we have to pare it down to the priority list of um, $135 million. So unless somebody has some additional transit projects to identify, um, I guess the discussion should probably center around how are we going to prioritize these projects because that will be the topic of next month's meeting. And, uh, Michael has to have it in July. So a July board approval works fine for him. If the board suddenly decides that they want to go on vacation and aren't going to meet, then he still needs something from us, some kind of a list of Here's the list, there should be no pushback from anybody, or here's the list except for one project that, that there may be some question about, but he needs something no later than that in July 11. Ken, I just wanted to say that the, the list that's in the packet is, is the, the wrong version. Um, we have two projects that, that were in the packet last month. Um, that are excluded from this list. Mm -hmm. There's an Academy Hancock uh, transfer station and um, expanded transit operations. So right, should, I remember that. At the bottom. Yeah. I, I yeah, th there were the several versions or something, because yeah. because that was and that was handed out at last month's meeting. So. Yeah. Well, there was one that was handed out at everybody's seat last yeah. month that didn't include these. And my second question is. Um, my understanding was the, the state's transit and rail advisory committee was doing a prioritization. So we that that, that is correct. They they are going to make the state priority mm -hmm. 
for what CDOT is, is submitting, uh, but they want input from us in our region. What, what's, what's our opinion? What's our priorities? And, and they will use that in their decision. Um, it is, if you remember getting over a year ago now when we went through this exercise for roads, uh, the Tier 1 and the Tier 2 it, on, on CDOT's 10-year list of, of road projects did the same thing. There, you know, we, we had some recommendations and CDOT didn't follow them. There, there was some difference on where CDOT wound up putting right. the money compared to what we recommended. Right. Well, I, I guess what I'm getting at is I, I don't think we, we don't have to go through a prioritization exercise next week I mean can't we just submit this list I mean if if more are trickling in from other entities can't we just add them to this list and then well, we, they want they want the list of everything in the right, region right the billion dollars plus worth of projects right, right. if that's what we know but in their priority list that that the track what do you say the, the abbreviation for that committee is track transit and radio committee mm -hmm. they're only going to According to what they're proposing, they're only going to plan on putting 135 million in our region. Right. Do we right. not want any input on what that 135 million should go on? Okay. Well, so what, what's going to be our our process for prioritizing that? I mean, good question. Victoria. Two cents. Um, as I don't run any transit. Um, you went through a whole scoring process to come up with what was funded and not funded, so why don't we look down at the highest scoring projects and go down for $135 million and see what that looks like. You know, Mike, Michael's one, one comment when I emailed him and, and asked for clarification, you know, what about this unfunded list? He says, yeah, I want to know everything, mm -hmm. but obviously for prioritization, if it's not in a regional plan or approved in a regional plan or local plan, you know, it's probably not going to fare well. So the fact that we've got 700 and um, 673 million of projects that did not score high enough or, or was not in our final selection for the 2040 plan, yeah, maybe they shouldn't be part of it and we, we should be looking first at the 53 million that did score high enough or was important enough that when we made our final recommendation and the board approved that was it so maybe start with those. I would take the 53 and then yeah and then start and then back out and yeah. for, for those that looking back after the fact as we started doing this we find out that there were some projects that did not get scored because there wasn't a, there was not enough projects for the funding category so we just said everything automatically gets funded under that funding category but we didn't take the time to score them but i think for transit i think most of them were scored but we can certainly look at that uh, that, that that's one option and jennifer I guess I would also suggest that I think that there are a couple projects in here that are in EAs that have been cleared, and I think it would be good to identify those projects as well. Um. Yeah, 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 and, and I think, so this draft list that Michael gave us um, a while ago, um, yeah, he, he just pulled everything from the plan, and yeah, the, mm -hmm. there, there could be some cleaning up of this, I think, definitely. And I know, you know, we have several different bus stop sidewalk improvement projects that could be, and they could be consolidated to say <clears throat> bus stop sidewalk improvements for a certain amount rather than having everyone itemized like this. But it could be a cleaner list. And, um, the other thing I was going to say was, um, so last month you presented, um, after after us, you presented to uh, MCC and CAC. Into the CAC, into the MCC. Have, I mean, have any other projects come tri trickling in? Okay. I didn't get any, any projects submitted, you know, spur of the moment at the meetings, and I haven't received anything since then. And, and, and before I forget it, you know, the, the idea of, of using the, the 53 million, the projects that are already there, minus 
the RTA projects or something. Uh, the capital projects are going to be bonding projects, and obviously not every project is a bonding type project. And as Michael discussed uh, last month, buying a bus, its lifespan is 12 years, and you're <clears> going to pay interest on it on a 20-year bond. So it's not the most appropriate type of project for for what he's looking for right now or that they're going to be considering. So, so yeah. capital projects of a bonding nature, those that we've already approved, use the 2040 scores for to go beyond that. And look at the EA cleared projects. Mm -hmm. Those three. Yeah, I think that would be a good start. Yeah, I do. Yeah. And then, okay, I'm going to throw, and I wish Michael were, was here, but um, so Senate Bill 1 passed, and now it's not transit, it's multimodal. So is this list going to morph into a multimodal list? And if so, then obviously we would want to have some other types of projects than just transit. Sorry, no offense. <laughs> Let me read you from the minutes of the stack meeting to answer your question. Um, this is Deborah Perkins Smith, who is the Chief Financial Officer. Director Chief. of DTD. Pardon? She's the Director of DTD. Okay, that's who she is. <coughs> to be clear, we're talking about two things a broader transit development program of all the projects we'd like to do, versus a smaller subset of transit projects suitable for bonding, which may or may not be identified on the ballot. The latter is the list. The latter list is the one where you need clear public support as well as a 50% local match. So there was a little bit of discussion at the meeting as to whether the final ballot initiative this fall uh, or whatever legislation that was passed would identify specific projects or just designate X percent of money for transit without a list of projects. So it's kind of in a flux right now. I, I don't know what Senate Bill finally, Senate Bill one finally read as to, as to how they did it. The, the part of the discussion also mentioned that the legislature was, you know, some of the bills was giving money to the cities and counties uh, who might choose then to use that money for operations um, rather than for capital projects. So I don't know in terms of Denver's ballot initiative whether they're going to have any any of these transit projects that we're identifying on that list specifically or whether they'll just have X percent of the money going to multimodal. Yeah. We should probably start thinking about the broader list because the, the Senate Bill 1 did put $76 million into a multimodal, so we probably should start thinking about that, too, so that we don't come at the last minute two months before somebody wants a recommendation from us. Well, if, if, we, if we keep the approach here that, that we're looking, we got $700 million worth of projects, and if we develop a the prioritization within our region, just as much as CDOT is trying to develop a prioritization for any money that comes forward, then we'd be ready. Well, but we wouldn't, though, because we could add trail projects and other types of projects to a multimodal pot of money. Okay. And that's what I want us to think about is, you know, how do we do that? Because I know there's some big trail projects, you know, the, the ring projects and things like that, that we may want to put into a multimodal pot of money mm -hmm. that wouldn't necessarily fit into a transit pot of money. Well, maybe so, there's the agenda item for next month. And so I, yeah, I want us to be <laughs> cognizant of maybe coming up with two types of lists. So this, you know, transit list may s satisfy Michael's needs, but at some point in the not too distant future, I think we're going to need a multimodal list. And so we should think about that and how we integrate both transit and other um, non-motorized projects into a, a multimodal list. Okay. And things are changing very quickly. They are changing <laughs> quickly. Thank you. 
All right. Anything else for this item? All right. Um, item 7E, uh, presentation on One Ride Joint Call Center. Brian Champion. And I should mention Brian is uh, Mountain Metro's new, well, fairly new, a couple months now, um, transit mobility coordinator. So please that's, that's be nice. Y yeah. It is. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, um, Brian. I'll try to be mindful of the time that we have remaining in the meeting. Again, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity per to present this item. My name is Brian Champion, and I'm the Mobility Coordinator at Mountain Metro Transit. I'm here today to present Mountain Metro's vision for the One, one Ride, one, one Call, One Click Information Center. I'll be highlighting One Ride's dual functions, that being coordinating specialized transportation and regional planning and referrals. Very quickly, just a reminder of what we do at Mountain Metro. Mountain uh, Metro Transit is a fixed route um, service providing over 3 million annual rides. About 300,000 of those rides are taken by seniors, 200,000 rides uh, by people with disabilities. Metro Mobility is an ADA complementary paratransit service for those unable to use fixed route. Metro Mobility provides approximately 150,000 trips per year. The type of service is twofold. There's curb-to-curb -curb service and door-to-door -door service for those passengers needing help to and from the bus. Taxis provide approximately 11,000 annual trips. Metro Rides is a city's alternative transportation service consisting of van, pool, and carpool matching services. And specialized transportation will be the focus of the rest of the presentation. So a little about specialized transportation as it is now. Seniors aged 60 years and older and people with disabilities is the customer base for specialized transit. Uh, the service area is growing and is nearly double in size compared to Metro Mobility Service Area, so roughly Briargate and Fountain North and South, Manitou Springs and Mark Scheffel, West and East. The standard of service is door through door service, which is assisting customers beyond the threshold of their origin and destination. Currently, there are four human service uh, organizations providing this specialized transportation community intersections in Vita, formerly Amblicap, Fountain Valley Senior Center, and Silver Key senior services. In 2017, these organizations provided over 39,000 trips using $800,000 in city and PPRTA funds. Each human service provider uses their own buses, staffs their own call center uh, for activities such as reservation taking, trip scheduling, and dispatch functions. As currently operated, a customer has to call one of these organizations directly to reserve a trip. If the desired trip time, day, or location is not available, or is available, the, the trip is reserved. If it's not available, an alternative time can be negotiated with the customer. If no agreed upon time is available, the customer must call another provider and proceed through the same reservation process they just went through. Uh, but this this means that the customer knows about the other human service provider, knows their contact information, their hours of operation to call the call center, and the type of clientele that they serve. Over the years, stakeholders have encouraged the transportation community to implement a consolidated call center for the purposes of expanding services, uh, make transportation-related information and service more accessible, and convenient to the public and to lower costs. These themes are echoed throughout these regional planning documents that I've listed here. Uh, these documents emphasize implementing a centralized call center, reduce the duplication of services, 
and expand the number of organizations providing specialized transportation services. In short, it's a lot of regional planning activities advocating for a consolidated and centralized um, call center which can reduce costs. The recommendations from these planning efforts is the nexus for one ride. And here is a graphical representation of one ride's functions and its subsidiary functions which I'll highlight in the next slides. Oops. For our customers, centralizing the contact point means the convenience of calling one number to reserve a city and PPRTA funded trip. They need only to know one telephone number, one schedule as to when they can call and speak with a live reservation taker. Our call center will be open weekends so customers can make a reservation eight to five any day, Monday through Sunday. And since we will be op operating weekends, we've offered to live answered weekend calls providers receive that currently go to voicemail. A customer does not have to call more than one provider to get a trip they want. We'll be able to assign a trip on up to four providers, so we'll do the work on behalf of our customers. Also, we'll book, for instance, a return trip on another provider to better ensure that trip is the closest to the desired pickup and drop off time for each customer. Where they may have gotten a denial due to capacity by calling one provider, we'll be able to look to other providers to make that trip. We are looking for opportunities to minimize duplicate activities and services. This includes assuming some of the call center activities now provided by each provider. So instead of each provider having a call center staff, these activities are centralized in a single location. Shedding call center responsibilities enables enable providers to lower the cost of each trip. That translates into more trips for the same amount of money. I made a point earlier to say we're looking or we're, we'll be booking city and PPRTA funded trips. Each provider uses other fundings other funding to provide trips, area agency and aging funds being the largest. We'd like to book all trips. We don't, want, we don't want their funds, we just want to book their trips on their behalf. With experience and our demonstrated success booking city and PPRTA trips, we hope we can convince each one of our providers that we are willing and able to handle the call center activities on their behalf and will do it for no cost to the providers. We are looking at all transportation dollars, not just the cost to Mountain Metro or to the provider, but to the cost of the region. And that's why we're also uh, consolidating the one ride call center with Mountain Metro, because it just makes sense combining uh, both of these functions into one center. So how will RunRide reduce duplicate services? That's by reducing the amount of buses that serve the same location at the same time. We'll be grouping trips together because we'll be looking at all the trips um, that used to be booked directly by one provider. We'll be looking at all the trips uh, that all four providers uh, would have been looking at. Another function that we'll be implementing uh, to lower costs will be trip brokering. So we'll be, we'll be brokering or strategically assigning trips among service providers based on the lowest cost solution. Each provider has recently offered their cost to provide a trip based on a mileage band. So when we receive a request for a five mile trip, we'll assign that trip to the lowest cost provider. Similarly with a 10 or a 15 mile trip. Now there are some limita limitations such as vehicle, pass vehicle capacity, ve uh, vehicle location and excessive trip times that we'll, all, we'll also have to consider. But the cost per trip is the starting point. And I'll come back to this in a uh, subsequent slide. 
So as we get some distance under our feet, we'll be looking to expand and enhance specialized transportation options. And these may include expanding competitive pricing, extending service hours and days to late nights and weekends, which we don't currently provide, provide some alternatives to buses as a sole delivery vehicle, enlarging the service area, such as providing trips into the Denver metro area to serve medical facilities and make regional transportation connections, and looking for ways to use some of the excess capacity vehicles, uh, excess capacity used for uh, vehicles for other purposes, such as retirement homes that may have buses idle during after hours and weekends. As you can see, there's really no solution for all the transportation needs in the community, so we want to build a toolbox with many tools uh, to address the nuances um, of trip, uh, trip purposes. I don't want to leave the impression that implementing these changes will be easy. There is no sugarcoating the challenges we'll, uh, we will encounter, our providers will, enc will encounter, and our customers will encounter. Uh, there are some short-term cost increases as we staff up one ride, and it will be some time before we see a reciprocal downsizing among our providers. But as staff offsets do occur as we consolidate the call center activities, we will see a reduction in cost. Uh, there is a lot of coordination that needs to take place between one ride and our providers. We'll need to be nimble in responding to lessons learned and be able to adapt our operating procedures as conditions warrant. And lastly, change is difficult. Someone who has been calling one of our providers for the last 10 years and speaking to the same reservation taker, getting on the same bus with the same driver, they're going to face uh, they're going to face a challenge because we're changing things up. But I think once we get on, once we get past the initial hump, um, providers and especially our customers will see the benefit of calling one consolidated uh, center for uh, for all their uh, trip purposes. So I'd want to circle back to trip brokering, and, and this is where we can save. Uh, the cost of providing trips out of the box. So I'm using the pricing provided by our providers to illustrate this process. We ask for prices by mileage band, 0 to 5, 5 to 10, and so on. So here is the pricing for a trip up to 5 miles. Agency A will provide a trip, a 5-mile trip, for $13.11. Because trip cost is a starting point when assigning a trip to providers, agency A will be offered that trip. If they decline the trip, we'll offer it to agency C, the next closest cost, the next lowest cost solution, and then on to agency B. We'll be assigning similar trips to agency A as much as possible because they're the lowest cost solution. Notice that this pricing allows two five-mile trips from agency A, uh, while the same, and actually a little bit more, would be one trip from agency C, the next lowest cost solution. Here's the pricing for a trip for a 5 to 10 mile uh, trip. Same process here, we'll offer the trip to agency A, and we'll work our way to agency B. Uh, agency C is if necessary. And here's the entire pricing structure. Um, so this, this really is a change in process. Again, as it has been and is currently run, a customer calls one of the providers directly. They'll ask for the trip. Um, if there is capacity, they'll be granted the trip, but there's no consideration of trip cost. So instead of a customer choosing a provider without regards to trip costs, we'll be assigning the trip starting with the cost of a trip. This is the other half of, or the, the other uh, functional side of one ride. 
for visitors, uh, for visitors, for those new to the community and residents and new residents, getting around town to essential services, the airport, making connections to other transportation carriers can be difficult and confusing, especially when you're looking for that information right when you need it. One ride will fill that role as a transportation options information center. We'll be the clearinghouse for all or nearly all of the transportation I, uh, options in the Pikes Peak region. We are assembling a inventory of transportation providers uh, from public carriers to private carrier, carriers and shuttles, taxis, TNCs, medical related transportation, and we'll be able to make a needs-based referral to visitors and residents seeking this information. Moreover, we will provide individualized trip plans. We recently had a call seeking assistance to arrange transportation for a teenager needing to get from the Denver area to Fountain. And we were, we were able to stitch together a, a trip plan using Bustang, our own Metro, uh, Mountain Metro Transit and Fountain Municipal Transit for that young man to make the trip. And we can coordinate this trip with providers, giving them a heads up that, at such, a, that such a passenger will make in these connections to ensure it's a successful handoff. Establishing and enlarging a transportation data bank, data bank is one of the most important functions we'll do, albeit the least sexy activity. Being on the receiving end of all the calls coming in from the, community, from the community asking about transportation, we'll be able to quantify the need, identify and articulate gaps in service, and adjust what we are doing to meet those needs. And most importantly, providing that information to transportation stakeholders to consider in decision making. Some of the programs that we're considering, administering from one ride is a van pool dedicated to serving veterans. We're also looking at a volunteer driver program, a mileage reimbursement program, and a call -a ride to connect outlying areas with our um, fixed route service area. So where are we in our progress? We've uh, established a facility. We've built out the second floor of, of an existing building with a lot of the floor space dedicated to one ride. We have a phone system in place that can handle all the incoming uh, telephone traffic. Uh, we have the software to interface between our scheduling system and the scheduling systems of our providers. Uh, we're also in the process of building a customer database and building out the website because we are a one call, one click facility. We're recruiting for our staffing for our reservation takers and we're currently negotiating contracts with our providers. Near term considerations, uh, we'll have a soft opening on July 1st. Uh, for the first one to three months, we're really gonna be in a learning mode of how our providers have Reserve trips, how they've grouped uh, group trips. We'll, we'll be mimicking those trips, so it's kind of a soft opening. It won't be as, as much of a culture shock to our customers. We'll be educating our customers of the benefits of one ride and how they can utilize all, the, all of our services. We'll be marketing and promoting the service to the community. And in month three to six, we'll begin brokering those trips so we can realize the, uh, the savings um, of choosing, strategically choosing who will provide those trips by mileage. And that concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Any questions for Brian? All right. Well, okay. thank you, Brian. Well, thank you it. very much. Thank you. Okay, item eight, member entity announcements. Is there anything anybody would like to share with the rest of us? So as a new member, I have some kind of probably what you would consider, I don't know if they're stupid questions, but I'm gonna ask them. I have questions about some of the stuff that I've heard here today. And you, you, those of you who know me know I can't resist asking them. So 
We have $700 million worth of identified projects, $135 million available, pretty, pretty huge gap between projects that are needed and funding that's available. We also, I don't know if the rest of you agencies are experiencing what we're experiencing in Manitou, and it's a push for ADA compliance with sidewalks, facilities, and I was wondering if any of the projects as they're being prioritized, if ADA compliance and, and in ADA enhancements regionally is being contemplated in the prioritization process, like sidewalk replacement, sidewalk widening, placement of ADA ramps, uh, multimodal trails that are more accessible for people uh, with ADA needs. Um, I, just, just curiosity question there, and um, I don't know if any of you are, can answer that for me or if that's just kind of a weird one that I'm throwing out there um, that hasn't been contemplated, so you can see if I don't, I don't know if I'm asking a stupid question or a smart one. Um, that's probably my biggest question because we have a big budget deficiency in trying to bring our town of 12 to 45 percent grade, graded streets into any kind of whimsical ADA compliance. All our facilities are majorly out of ADA compliance because they're all historic in nature. So certainly we would be looking for some money to help us with ADA compliance. Uh, well, I can answer some of that. You know, the list that was included in the packet, um, I mentioned this earlier, a lot of the um, bus stop and sidewalk improvement projects that we have are for sidewalk bus stop improvements along our bus routes, um, you know, which may include there may be sidewalks there, but they may be very narrow and not up to ADA standards or not have any curb cuts. So, um, you know, those improvements make those enhancements around where our bus stops are so our passengers can get from one side of the, of the street to the other. Um, you know, the, the city, citywide has, I think, RTA projects that work on other sidewalk or ADA needs throughout the city, but um, I mean, you have Mountain Metro Service in Manitou, um, you know, there could always be room for more projects like that on this, this list, um, but I, I'm not sure, do you have RTA um, projects too that are identified for um, we have We have RTA maintenance dollars that um, for example, if we do a mill overlay project on a roadway, we're faced with bringing that roadway into ADA compliance now with the new ProWag standard. So we have, we're going to have to figure out a way because we, you know, we, we get a pretty small percentage of the regional RTA dollars, um, and it's still a lot for Manitou. I mean, I'm not complaining by any means, but those dollars are definitely carved down with the need to bring adjacent sidewalk and intersections into compliance with ADA, mm -hmm. with ADA standards. Right. Um, so I just think it might be something that would be worth looking at regionally for us all because we're all going to be faced with the, the new ProWag standards comes into effect, I think, in September, October. You might know better than I do, Victoria, but so anyway. That's an interesting one for me. I was wondering if our creek, I don't have the list, I didn't get a packet, and I am really out of tune with this. So I was wondering if the Creek Walk and Midland Trail are on the list, and if they're prioritized on your on this, on this the list for funding. Um, Mr. Chair? Yes. Mr. Chair, members of the committee? Uh, it, for these sorts of questions, can, I can offer that our staff can sit down with you. I'm new here as well, uh, but a, again, uh, what's on the agenda versus if you've got some specialized questions, maybe we don't need to do that with everybody. Okay. But we can go, we can have my, uh, the staff sit with you. We're going through the call for project right now. So we can not, not explain how the scoring works, but then we can also explain what the process is for you to go uh, and actually apply for those. Did I get that right, Ken, with my? Perfect, so, thank right. you. So that way we're not doing anything. I'm also, I don't understand, I don't know all of the open meeting rules here, but we also, uh, where I come from, you got to be careful about what's on the agenda, and if this is an announcement versus something else, you got to be careful about that. But we're happy to take care of you off offline on that, and maybe I'm being overly cautious. So that's thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, and Shelley, you know, not to confuse 
both issues, but this transit development program, you know, there has to be, you know, not talking about this multimodal list that may we may be addressing in the future, but the transit development program, um, you know, that's where projects that you have that are along a bus route could be added to this list. But, you know, also the 2045 long-range plan call for projects is, is coming up. So now is the time to start looking at your area and, you know, TAP funds are usually a good um, option or STP Metro funds are a good option for sidewalk ADA improvements. So that's coming up, I think, with a deadline of July 30th. Thank you. Yeah. So, so there's a couple options there. Yeah. Kevin? Just to add on what Brian said, the call for projects is going on right now. And uh, if you have any questions on that, we can certainly reach out to staff. But we also have all the instructions on our website. And we'll, okay. and, uh, it'll let you know if money's available in each funding category. We can all appreciate your positions, Shelley. We've all been there. We've all been the new kids on the block uh, at one point, and it is. It is drinking from a fire hose, so I understand. Yeah, I'm just trying to wrap my brain around all yeah, these acronyms you guys are using at this point. So, yeah, but reach out for staff. I mean, they have money to send people on cruises to take photos, <laughs> and um, <laughs> and any of us would be glad to help you too. Yeah, so, you. All right. I believe it was an eligible Okay. Yeah. All, right. <laughs> all right. Any other member entity announcements? Yeah, Jennifer. Great, thank you. Um, June 6th, well, during the week of the first week of June, we'll be having the Warrior Games at Kasaka. We'll be a big bike race going on June 6th in the large parts so of Jay and Boulevard between Academy Drive down to Pine Drive with the close of the traffic. So if you are planning to come up to Kasaka, June 6th may not be a good time to come up the south side and go up to the north. Thank you. Anything else? Okay, items for future TAC meetings. So we probably ought to make a recommendation on our transit project list. Mm -hmm. And the small area forecast. Small area forecast and the, um, the TIP flexible policy, uh, uh, if anybody's interested in that, the over, overfill money, right? That could be a TIP amendment. Right. If anybody seeking those funds, right? Okay. And the uh, addendum to that, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, is if there is a separate uh, multimodal list, we'll, we'll make sure we send out an email on that and put that on the agenda as well. Okay. So we'll we'll uh, make some calls and see if it's a separate process or if it's incorporated within, uh, so you all uh, know what's going on and have the opportunity to apply for those funds. Sounds good. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Brian, this is Wendy. Uh, we need to put the rule forward on the list, too. Okay. All right. So you're going, are you going to be sending those out, or you're just going to be making the request on behalf of all of us? I'm going to take them to you next month so that we can discuss it. Okay. All right. So it will be an information so item? We have to verify and, and whatnot, and then we have a rule forward then, okay? Okay. Great. Thank you. No problem. All right. Anything else that anybody would like to share? All right. Have a great afternoon. We're adjourned. Thank you, Wendy. Goodbye.